Awesome. It took me all week to get those two words down. That was good, good work, good work. Uh, hey, it is, uh, it's awesome to be part of uh, the body of Christ, right, around the world. What he's doing is not just confined to here in Baltimore and Dundalk and the United States. It's happening all over the place. And so uh, it's encouraging uh, just to be part of what he's doing there through them and online. And so uh, we love you all out there. Thank you. And uh, we can't wait to hear back great reports of what's going on. Um, two quick other things I want to uh, bring to your attention before we dive into our message today. The first is uh, last week I announced to us as a church that I'm going to be going on a sabbatical this summer. Uh, this uh, beginning, end of this month, July and August, I'll be uh, heading out. The trustees have approved for me to take a 10-week sabbatical. And uh, you may be wondering, what does that mean? A sabbatical is not an extended vacation. It's not a punitive thing. It's not a leave of absence. Uh, I'm not having a mental breakdown that I know of. I, I think you guys are real. Uh, but... Um, <laughs> It is a biblical pattern of rest and actually is encouraged for pastors in my role to take a sabbatical once every seven years. And uh, this will be my first in 19 years. And so I'm overdue and I'm ready. Uh, I think I'm excited to do it. A little nervous, but I can't wait to do it. And so while I am gone on those 10 weeks, it will not be a pause break for us as a church. We're actually going to be doing amazing, awesome things through uh, the summer. The living room is going to be kicking off in just a few short weeks. The Big Tent Revival is going to be happening uh, while I am on sabbatical. While I'm gone, this stage is going to be filled with so many awesome voices. All five of our overseers, which are local church pastors uh, in the area and in New Jersey, they're going to be coming and speaking, so you get to hear from some really world-renowned voices. Our team of associate pastors, they do an amazing job, and uh, Pastor Lori is going to continue to be at the helm uh, and, and provide leadership and be here for all of that. And so I will miss you. Uh, but I will be back, and we're going to pick up with the book of Revelation when I return. Uh, so I just would cover your prayers while I'm gone, uh, just that God would cover me, recharge me, uh, refill me, give me vision for the next 20. Because here's the deal, I want to be your pastor for a really long time. And I want to have a fresh vision as we move into it. So... Thank you uh, for your support and generosity in that. And then one quick update uh, that I forgot to tell our 930 uh, service this morning, but this past week, Liam's adoption was finalized. The judge signed off. So that's huge. That's it's just huge for us as a family. Thank you for everybody who's known the process, or maybe you're here for the first time, and you're like, hey, that sounds awesome. Uh, thank you for that, too. Uh, thank just God for his hand throughout that entire process, and, uh, and he's ours. So praise, uh, praise the Lord. All right, let's get into our message today. As I mentioned, we're going to be picking up with Revelations when I get back from sabbatical, because there's a few things that I wanted to address and talk on before I, I, I took off for that, before I headed out for that. And so today... Is, uh, is one of those Sundays. I want to talk about something specific uh, to the DNA uh, of us as a church and many other churches around the world. Uh, but it can be a uh, confusing thing or maybe even a source of disagreement, even a source of disunity. And so I wanted to take today to provide clarity and actually ask, I, I believe, the Lord to pr provide unity and peace among us as a family to draw us together towards one vision. And so uh, I want to lay the groundwork of what we're talking about with this. Two short verses. Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. This is the day of Pentecost. Peter has come down, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he quotes the prophet Joel when he says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. How many people? All people, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I want you to notice the people groups that are mentioned in this prophecy. First, all people are all races, all colors of skin, all cultures, all languages, all people groups are going to have the Spirit poured out upon them, number one. Number two, every generation. 
Young men, old men, it doesn't matter what age you are, God has given us the ability, the opportunity to step in and feel, to receive his baptism and to be empowered to go out and to prophesy. What does it mean to prophesy? It's proclaim the good news of the gospel, all ages. Number three, all classes of people. It doesn't matter your economic bracket. He says, even on my servants, and that would have meant at that time, those that have no property, belong, have nothing that belongs to them, they are an indentured servitude. Even they will be empowered by the Spirit. And finally, men and women shall prophesy, shall proclaim the goodness of God. Jesus, before he ascended, he gave us the great commission, Matthew, Matthew 28, verse 19. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. How many nations is that? That's a lot of nations, right? We need both men and women, every race, every class, every economic bracket, and every person, men or women, man or woman, to be activated into the commission of God to see this thing accomplished in our time. And so I want to make a statement up front, and then I'm going to spend the remainder of our time showing you why we have come to this conclusion. At Epic, we empower women fully into every level of gifting and leadership in the local church. Every woman fully. So whether you're a doctor or a stay-at-home mom, whether you're a lawyer or a teacher, whether you are government official, a small group leader, a preacher, pastor, administrator, assistant, manager, or an assistant to the manager, there is no lid for you in this house, and I believe in the body of Christ. But here's the rub. There are a large number of of churches and denominations that do not empower women into every level of gifting and leadership. There's the rub. And so there's a couple of groups of people in this room. One, you didn't even know that that was a thing, right? And some of y'all were like, ooh, this is like a church fight. This is going to be exciting. Let's see a little, you know. Two, some of y'all knew it was a thing, and either you uh, grew up in a church where, you know, women kind of did their thing. Uh, maybe you grew up in a church, and, and, and they were a part of that. You know, women were not allowed to preach or teach or be pastors or so forth. Or maybe, as an adult, you have kind of learned this on your own journey. Perhaps some of your favorite pastors or preachers or podcasts you listen to somewhere along the line have quoted a few verses about women being silent in the church and not having authority over the man and and, and you've wondered, well, hold up, how come Epic, at Epic there are ladies on the stage? How come at Epic there are women pastors? I, I don't understand the tension uh, between these two. Today, I wanted to take the time to explain how we've come to this conclusion that we empower women fully in every level of leadership and gifting. Now, there's a few stances you can take in, in, in these two uh, or, or, or to this, this statement. First is you can disagree with it. You have the right, the opinion, to disagree. A lot of my uh, close uh, friend, pastor friends, are on the other side of that, and, and, and they, they do not uh, agree with this statement at all. Their churches are designed around a different uh, structure. They uh, adamantly disagree. You can not just disagree, but you can kind of tolerate it. You know, you can be like, well, I don't know, but, you know, Epic's my people. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm rolling with you all. Okay, you do your thing. I'm here. I'm, I'm down, you know. Outside of disagreeing and tolerating, you can actually believe it. You can be compelled like I am through Scripture that this is a truth of, of, of God's freedom that he has given either men or women to go be activated. And then there's another final stance is you can champion it. You can say, not only do I believe that, but it is actually a part of my life mission to see every person activated into everything that God has for them, whether they are a man or a woman. And so there's a few stances you can take. My job today, what my hope is, is that I can compel you and uh, through the word and the spirit can bring a heart transformation for you to move one step. Maybe from disagreement to even maybe just tolerating. Maybe you've been tolerating it, but you know what? I believe in that. Maybe you've been leaving in it. Maybe it's time to activate you and to champion it and to see every person activated into all God has for them. And so today's message is entitled, The Free Are Empowered. The Free Are Empowered. We believe here 
God, uh, we see among us that God sees the lost found, the found freed, and the free empowered. And so today I want to focus on that last part of that statement, the free are empowered. And so let's just pray and ask God to be with us and give us his wisdom today as we step into this topic together. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your freedom that you give. God, it is for freedom that you have set us free. Lord, you love us. You called us. You freed us by your power, uh, by your word. And so, Lord, I pray today that that's what we would experience, a freedom in the house, that, Lord, you would break chains of bondage. Lord, you would break thought patterns and belief systems that have kept us bound. And, Lord, I rebuke every, uh, every act of the enemy that would cause division, distraction, and separation in this house. And, Lord, I speak under the, uh, the, the influence of the Holy Spirit. I will prophesy a peace, a unity in this body. That, Lord, you would draw us together under one banner. It is your name that we would see your mission happen. Lord, we would see disciples made all around the world. And we would not let anything divide us, even moments like this. And so, God, I ask you, Lord, to move among us. Speak to us today. Let us leave this time different than we came in, transformed by your power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, there are a few main texts that uh, seem to be the ones that are issues, and we're going to talk about those t together in detail. 1 Timothy 2 and uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. But I want to remind us, before we get into those directly, that a doctrine, a, a principle, a belief is not built on one of two, one or two verses, three or four verses. In fact, doctrines have to pass the acid test of being in agreement through the totality of Scripture from beginning to end. And here's the thing. We see women empowered through the entirety of Scripture from beginning to end. Stephen Dempster, a biblical scholar, he sums up this theme of women throughout the Old Testament facing this thing he calls women against the beast. He says it this way. You see first Eve versus the serpent, Sarah and Rebekah versus barrenness, Tamar versus Judah, Jacobet and Miriam versus Pharaoh. Deborah and Jael versus Sisera, Ruth and Naomi versus death, Hannah versus barrenness, Jushaba versus Athaliah. In, in all of these examples of struggle, these women of faith are engaged in a battle to save the people of God. The victory of Esther over Haman dramatically continues this theme. Women were empowered not only uh, as a secondary option that there was no one else there. It was a crucial, critical part of the story. With some other women that we see empowered throughout Scripture, a, a small sampling, Deborah was a judge, a leader, and a prophet, Judges chapter 4. Miriam, uh, a prophetess, mentioned with Moses in line of leadership, Micah chapter 6. Isaiah's wife was a prophet, Isaiah 8. Anna prophesied over Jesus when he was eight days old. Priscilla, we're going to learn more about her in just a few minutes. Phoebe, learn more about her in a few minutes. Lydia, open the door to the gospel being shared into Europe and ultimately the United States because she made her home a church uh, in the place of Philippi. There are many women and examples that have been empowered from the beginning. Let's look at Jesus. Many places Jesus had women in the spotlight of his ministry. First, Jesus' birth. We believe in the virgin birth. The only, think about this, the only human DNA that Jesus had would be from a woman. That feels significant in some way. <laughs> Jesus' ministry. Luke records that there was a group of wealthy women that not only walked with him, worked with him, but were patrons of his ministry. Jesus' death. He was anointed before he died by a woman with her tears in her hair. He was anointed for burial after the cross. Jesus' resurrection, he was shown first to the women in all four Gospels. They were the first proclaimers of the resurrection to the world. Y'all women were. Not the men. <laughs> The birth of the church, the day of Pentecost. Acts tells us that it was both men and women that the Holy Spirit came down upon and they exited the upper room with a spirit baptism to go out and share the gospel, both men and women. In fact, there are 866 verses in the Bible that were either proclaimed or written by women. 
And so we ask ourselves, what about those, the problem texts? The problem is in air quotes because I don't think it is a problem. What about those texts? I want to unpack each of them together with you in detail. And there's going to be some Bible nerd stuff in here. Uh, if you're into that, take some notes. If you're not, hang on. We're going to land this plane together. We'll come back down into our ozone, and uh, we'll pick you all up along the way. But what about these problem texts? First thing I want to say before we get into them is that what I am not telling you is what's called a trajectory hermeneutic. Fancy word for if the Bible continued to be written over another couple hundred years, this is the trajectory that it was on, hermeneutic being interpretation. I am not giving that to you because actually that's a very dangerous practice to say if the Bible was continued to be written, this was the trajectory it was on. It probably would have said X, Y, Z. That's how you get into some trouble, right? Because <laughs> you can put your own stuff in there and say it probably would have said that. Mm, that's not what I'm saying, okay? What I am saying is there is an accurate interpretation of the text that's there that I think is going to help us understand what these texts are actually saying. But let's first read the first problem text, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. It says, A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Now, how can we look at that and say that that does not mean what it says it means, right? First thing I want us to learn is that context matters. Context matters. What's the context around what Paul is writing to this church? I'm going to read for you another verse. It has nothing to do with this discussion, but I want to show you what context does to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7. It says, a man ought not to cover his head. Since he's the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. What? Is Paul talking about like hats in church? Is he talking about long hair on guys? We might be in trouble. If so. <laughs> Let me show you this picture. This is actually a, a statue of Caesar Augustus. And I want to read for you a footnote in the ESV Archaeology Study Bible about this text that we just read. And the footnote says this. A Roman statuary uh, depicts emperors and senior magistrates as partially covering their heads with the fold of their togas when offering a public sacrifice, praying or reading and entrails, prophesying. Paul instructs the Corinthian men not to dishonor Christ by praying to him in the same way that addresses uh, others addressed false gods, such as Apollo. By praying with their heads uncovered, they show that they are praying in a new way and worshiping a different deity than their pagan neighbors. Context matters. Paul's not talking about you wearing your Orioles hat in church. He's not talking about the length of your hair in this statement. He's talking to people at a specific place and a specific time that are dealing with a specific problem. It is a situational instruction. And so as we read 1 Timothy 2, 1 Corinthians 14, this is the question we need to ask. Is this a situational instruction or is it a universal command? Let's define those two terms. Situational instruction is an instruction for a specific purpose, specific time, and a specific people. A universal command is for everyone at all times and all situations. Let's go through a few examples and see if we can, you know, exercise this, this muscle together. Uh, this verse, Romans 16, 16, greet one another with a holy kiss. Is that universal to everyone or is it situational to them? Situational, because if it's universal... Pucker up, buttercup, right? <laughs> the lobby's going to be packed or it's going to be empty. There's, 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 <laughs> some of y'all be like, I need a, a new exit out of this building. Please not kiss me. All right, what is, what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy and walk humbly with our God? Universal or situational? It's universal. Micah 6, 8. That's for everybody to do. All places, all times. You live to that. How about this one? 1 Timothy 5.23, stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and frequent illness. Is that universal or situational? <laughs> so we are like, hey, good news. <laughs> I brought one with me. <laughs> you shouldn't joke like that. But it's situational. It's Timothy. He's talking to him. Timothy was sick. He had health issues, and he's like, stop drinking the water, man. 
How about this one? Jesus, John 15, 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another. That's not situational. It's universal. That's for all people, all time. 1 Corinthians 7, 1. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. That, it's not universal because we're in trouble. If so, right? Some of y'all ladies are like, please be universal. This guy's. He's trying to put his arm around me, it's, you know. <laughs> if you're taking your shot in church, that's, that's pretty bold. Anyway. <laughs> All right. So is it situational instruction or is it a universal command? Let's go, let, let, let's unpack it and see the context of what's going on and see if it's situational or universal. Context of what's happening at the time when Paul writes to Timothy that he wants women to learn in, in quietness and submission and to not have authority or to teach, uh, teach over men. This is the context. He's writing to the places called Ephesus. In Ephesus, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was the temple of Artemis towards the god, goddess Diana. Goddess Diana. There are statues we have found of this goddess Diana with 12 breasts. She was considered the mother of all living things. Worship of Diana included lewd acts, drunkenness, orgies, and things that were vile towards and with women to worship this, this false goddess. The teachings of Diana were that women were first. Woman would birth man. Man was the one who sinned first. I want you to see that and keep that in your mind as we start to read through what he's actually saying. He is directly speaking to and correcting heresy from the people of the time. This is what they're being taught. They're coming into the church being taught by culture. And Paul's writing them saying, time out, y'all. This is way off. There is a situational uh, grievance that's happening that Paul is trying to correct. And so I want to read the context around these two verses. 1 Timothy 2, starting at verse 8. He begins a chapter. We don't have time to get into it, but he's like, man, I want all people to come to know that Jesus Christ is Lord. He came. He died on the cross with our sin on his shoulders. He went to the cross. He died. He resurrected three days later. And, man, everything has changed because of it. In the verse 8, he says, therefore... I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. There is like, oh yeah, we should all be praying, lifting holy hands. But there's a situational thing with this anger and disputing. Maybe it was a disposition of the people at the time. We don't know. Verse 9. I also want the women to dress modestly, with decency and propriety, adorning themselves, not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes. Remember, the priestess of Diana were these young virgin priestess that had pearls in their hair, elaborate, adorned hairstyles, and they were dressing not modestly because the entire worship of this goddess involved the sexualization of women. And so Paul's saying, no, no, no. If you're in here, if you're part of this body, that's not what God created you for. No, I would rather you dress modestly without all that stuff. Verse 10, but with good deeds. Let that be what adorns your life. And appropriate, what is appropriate for women to profess, uh, who profess to worship God. Verse 11 and 12 we just read. A woman should learn in quietness and in submission What's happening in the cult, the, or the temple of Artemis? Women are in charge. They're prophesying and they're spewing heresy in that. He says, no, 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 let's, let's flip the script. They should learn in quietness, submission. I do not per permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. He's addressing the heresy that's being taught by them. No, 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 that's not what happened in verse 14. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner or brought sin. Verse 15. But women, but, but women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. All right, now, there's so much going on in this text that we need to look at the original language and the context of what's going on. Verse 15 specifically uh, women, I left these little footnotes because in the NIV and other uh, translations, they'll give you these footnotes of, of original language issues that are going on here. We'll be saved through childbearing if they continue through faith and love and all these and prosperity. Three interpretive things that are happening in this one verse. Number one, it was believed at the time if you wanted your pregnancy to go smoothly and your child to be born healthy, you needed to sacrifice, worship Diana, and she would bless your birth. And so Paul's saying, no, 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 forget her. 
Women will be saved. God will be the one saving you through childbearing. Don't think that she's the one blessing you. It's Yahweh and Yahweh only who's the one who's walking with you through this. Interpretation number one. Interpretation number two. These young virgin priestess in the temple of Artemis, sometimes the only way out of this cult was to get married and to have a child so they could be freed from being sex slaves in this, in this temple. That was, their, that was gonna be their ultimate end. He says, you'll be saved through this childbearing. Interpretation number three in this multi-lover, multifaceted. When it says, so women, that women is not actually in there. It's a, it's a pronoun. It actually says, but she. Who's the she? Who was the woman that was just mentioned in the verse before? Eve. Eve. Adam and Eve. But she will be saved, protected, carried through. And there is actually a definite article, the, before childbearing. She will be saved through the childbearing. Who's the, the child being born that will bring salvation through Eve? Jesus, the Messiah, right? Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. The seed of the woman will be the one that crushes the, the head of the serpent, even though the serpent will strike his heel. It, she will be saved through the childbearing. Because he just said she was the one who took the apple off of the tree. But God's redemption, it's through her that the serpent will be crushed once and for all. Do you see the poetic movement that just happened? It can't be a universal command. Because what about women that never bear children? Well, they, are they not saved? The barren woman, the single woman, the woman who just uh, decided not to have children. Is salvation removed from them? It has to be a situational instruction for this people in time. And so that's my judgment, and I think it's a compelling one, is that this verse, 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12, is a situational instruction for a specific time, specific people, and a specific place, and not a universal command. Problem scripture number two. Second or First Corinthians chapter fourteen verses 30, thirty four and thirty five. It says, "Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says." What law, by the way? We don't have time to get into that. Verse thirty five. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. The preceding 10 verses in this chapter are talking about order in the church. We should do a series on the book of Corinthians, these letters, because the church in Corinth were jacked up. These people were a mess. And Paul's like, okay, per my last letter, <laughs> apparently you didn't hear me. There was all kinds of crazy stuff going on. And so in the 14th chapter, he's talking to him about order in the, the gathering. And there are three different occasions. Like, look, if you're given a, a message in tongues and there's no one to interpret that message, you need to sit down and shut up. And there's another moment. He's like, if, if you're teaching and there's two or three messages and there's one who's, who's seated and you're standing, sit down and let them talk. And then he goes into silence and, and, and listening in this moment about women and husbands and the relationship between the two when it comes to learning in church. And so is this situational instruction or is it a universal command? If it's universal, he's contradicting himself in the three chapters before this. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse, verse 5, he says, But every woman who prays or prophesies, and then he goes to explain what should happen when you do that. If he's telling you when you pray or prophesy, do it this way, but then three chapters later he said, Psych! Shut up and sit down. <laughs> this is a rock moment. What's your name? It doesn't matter what your name is. Shut up, jabroni. This is a ball moment where he just, is that what he did? No. <laughs> no. This has got to be a situation. We'll continue to unpack why, why that is. Romans chapter 16, Paul's farewell chapter to the Roman church. There's a lot that goes on in this one chapter, and I think a lot can tell us about what's going on in Timothy and Corinthians. Um, and his mindset, his belief, his, the structure in his mind for the church. In Romans 16, he starts by commending a woman named Phoebe. Phoebe is commended in the same, should be commended in the same line as government officials. It's the same weight and the same words he uses here. Phoebe is a deacon, a deaconess in a lo another local church. But Phoebe is the one who receives the letter, the, the letter to the Romans, and is the one who walks it to the Roman church, delivers it to them. Well, what does deliver mean? 
Deliver means she opens the letter, reads it aloud to the body, and explains thought, uh, Paul's thought process behind what he has written. What do we call somebody who opens the Bible in a public gathering, reads it, and explains what it means? What do we call that person? Pastor, preacher, teacher, right? We see it in here. This is who Phoebe actually is to the Roman believers. And the book of Romans is Paul's most dense, thickest treatise on doctrine and theology. And why would he give it to a woman if he thought a woman should not exercise authority or teach or, or, or speak to a public gathering universally? 1 Corinthians 14 has got to be a specific situational thing that's happening in here. He continues, Paul continues in Romans 16, and he commends a woman named Junia. He greets Junia, a woman named Junia who is listed as an apostle, an apostle. If you don't know what that means, it means she's a big deal. <laughs> Next, he talks to uh, about a group, uh, this couple named Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila possibly could have been the pastors of the church of Ephesus before Timothy came. Priscilla and Aquila are credited to preach the, the whole full gospel to a man named Apollos, who is a great teacher. Some believe he's the one who wrote the book of Hebrews. Early on, when we meet Priscilla and Aquila, they are listed in the, the other order. Aquila, the man, was listed first. Priscilla, the woman, listed second. The husband first, the wife second. Almost immediately after and every time after that, they are reversed. Priscilla, the wife, listed then Aquila, the husband, listed second. This is huge in the original writing of the text because the order of the names tells us the order of leadership and authority in the relationship. When Saul first gets called into ministry, it's Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul. And then all of a sudden, Paul elevates, he's called, he's anointed, he's gifted, he's given authority and leadership. And every other time after, it's Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas. Something happened in the gifting of that relationship. And so Priscilla and Aquila is showing us Priscilla the wife was the one in leadership. Aquila walking with her, next to her, not subservient to her, but co-leading, pastoring in the region. So being silent as a deacon, as a pastor, as an apostle, a prophet, and a teacher seems pretty hard to do. In fact, it's impossible. You show me a way to be silent and still be a teacher. Hey, it's a big whiteboard. You'll be writing on all day long. It doesn't make any sense. It has to be situational. So my judgment, 1 Corinthians 14, 13 through 34, is a, this is a situational instruction for a specific time, specific people, and a specific place, not a universal command. Paul's teachings empower they free women to be who God created them to be, to get the gifts that God has created them. And all four areas of the gifts, the giftings that are written in the New Testament, none of them are given, designated, uh, given by designation through man or woman. It is given freely to men and women. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you all to be uninformed. Now let me jump down to this. Women, you all are empowered. But what does that mean for my guys? Guys. Dudes. Men. What does this mean for you and me? What's happened in many of the churches around the world, especially in the West, in America, Europe, places like that, the church has had a feminine push leaning and a feminine swing in the way we worship and what we do. And the reason is, is because women have dominated the culture of churches. What has happened is women have been empowered and stepped into their leadership. And what has happened has been a vacuum of male leadership. Too many men in the churches, churches have abdicated their role because a strong woman has come along and taken their place. And we say, man, you're doing a great job. Keep on doing it. Call me if you need some help. You need me to move a chair? I'm your guy. Men, 
No, 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 no. This is not how it should be. It is not an either or. This is a both and. We need women to be empowered and step into their roles. Just as men, we need you to step into your role. We need you to be who God called you to be. Free to be empowered means us men too. We need to reclaim our biblical masculinity as guys. There's a book written by a guy named uh, Matt Fuller of the title, Reclaiming Masculinity. He gives seven succinct ways that we can reclaim the masculinity that God has given us. Way number one, the first is this, is remembering that men and women really are different. What I'm talking to you about is not that men and women are re irreplaceable, that they can each do a diff a different jobs. Giftings are without repentance and go to each other. But men and women really are different. I'm not telling you that just anybody can do a job. God called you and created you, gifted you, wired you to do something specific. Now, that doesn't mean he'll send somebody else. If you abdicate and step out of it, he'll send somebody else to fill the role. But it doesn't mean it'll be the same. Ask any single single mom what it's like to be mom and dad. God will gift you for it. Man, he'll provide you everything you need, but it's not the same as having a loving, present dad in the house. Right? And it works both ways, single dads. I, I, I'm not leaving you out either. It's hard for you to be dad and mom, right? God created the nuclear family for a reason because men and women really are different. Reclaiming our biblical masculinity, number two, is by taking responsibility. Taking responsibility. Whether that means over work, school, family, community, leadership, if God put it in the realm of you to be responsible for, you stepping away from it is creating a void in the church, in the community, in our cities, and in our country, in our world. Number three, be ambitious for the things of God. Be ambitious for the things of God. It should be your number one priority. Seek first the kingdom of God. And then all these other things will be added unto you. We need men that are passionate about building the congregation, the church, seeing communities change, finding sons and daughters to pour into. Be ambitious about it. Don't be the, the husband that's drugged to church by your wife because you know you're trying to Get some later. You just go, you're going on Sunday. That was crude. I shouldn't have said that. But I know what y'all thinking. I'll do her thing now. Later. I'm going off script. And that's not good. Okay, this is number three. Number four. Use your strength to protect. Use your strength to protect. Every culture that has turned its back on God, what has become in the wake of that is women and children are the ones who pay the price. They are the ones that become marginalized and brutalized by men who have turned their back on the things of God and done it their own way. Whether that means by domineering and using their strength to crush or abdicating and giving their strength away. Men, you are strong. Whether that means physically or in character or in spirit, it doesn't matter. But use that strength to protect those that are around you. And look, there may be women around you like, Psh, I don't need your protection. I can do this myself. Okay, that's cool. But if you ever do, you know my number. Use your strength to protect. Number five, display thoughtful chivalry. Display thoughtful chivalry. I know some say chivalry is dead. And women killed it. Some may think that. I didn't say that. Some may think that. <laughs> but guys, we're the ones who gave it up. We're the ones who let it go. We're the ones that stopped teaching it generation to generation. What is chivalry? It means using strength to serve. Use your strength to serve. This is what biblical masculinity looks like. Number six, invest in friendships. We ain't got time for that. But you need community. You can't do it by yourself, guy. And number seven, raise healthy sons. Raise healthy sons. Daughters as well. But this is sons not in the biological sense. This is sons in the spiritual sense. Older men, we need you to give us your wisdom. It says in here, the, the, the guys with the gray hair, y'all need to be teaching us. Younger, I put myself in the younger. See how what I just did right there? 
little interpretive move. I said, we need you to be teaching us, young guys. We need to raise healthy sons. And so I, I want to uh, land the plane on this idea. Empowering women is not a heaven or hell issue. We can disagree on that and still see each other in heaven one day. But it is an issue of unity in this house. This is who we are. This is who God called us to be. Like, like discrimination based on race, based on age, based on class or economic status, we want all people to lead and to function like God created you to. And so ladies in the room, if you have been marginalized in the body of Christ, in a church setting, this one or any other, because you are a woman, if you've been pushed aside because you were not a man on behalf of that pastor, that leader, or even myself, I want to say to you, I'm sorry. Will you forgive us? You deserved better. I don't think it's the heart of God to do that. I don't think it's the heart of Scripture, and it's definitely not the heart of this house. There is no lid for you in this place. Men, if you have marginalized a woman in the body of Christ, if you have made her a second-class citizen because of an interpretation in Scripture, I believe it's fitting for us to repent. I believe it's fitting for us Maybe you need to have a conversation with a person. Maybe it's just between you and God. But I think it's be, it would behoove us to make a shift in our action and our heart posture. Men, if you have abdicated your role and your responsibility, because there's a lot of strong women in this church that are leading, and that's awesome. But if you're viewing that as a license to step out, you need to repent. We need to lead together arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder. We need all of the body of Christ to accomplish the commission because it's a great commission. And we need every single one of us to make it happen. We believe we're going to see the lost found, the frown feared, and the free empowered. But look, before we get too empowered, some of us need to to be free of a couple things. That's belief systems and, and hurt that we've been handed. And before we get free, some of us need to go ahead and be found first. Maybe this morning your first step is to receive Jesus into your life for the very first time. And if that's you, I want us to take that step together. I want to ask you to take a posture of prayer, heads bowed, eyes closed across the house. This morning, if, you, if that's you if, you, if you say, Pastor Chris, I... I Man, first thing I need to do before I go do an empowerment, before I need to go out and serve and, and step into my calling, first thing I need to do is just to get right with God. I need to say yes to Him. I got good news. Scripture says it's easy, that it's, it's, it's simple. It's a, it's a belief in your heart and a confession with your mouth. And in a moment, we're all going to pray a prayer together. It's something we do every single week. And I'm not going to call anybody out. But if you would say, Pastor Chris, that, that's me. I, you know what? I need to be found this morning. I need to come back home into the arms of my Father. I want to say yes to Jesus today. Would you just lift your hand up high? Nobody looking around just between you and him? Amen. Awesome. Great hands. I, I love that. Amen. One, two, three. Praise God. Four. Back there, I see you. Awesome. If that's you online, man, just type in the chat. I need a fresh start. I'd love to pray with you. All right, if your hands are up, you can put them down across this whole house. Whether you raised your hand or you didn't, come on, church. Can we all repeat this prayer together? Say it when we see Dear Jesus, I thank you for going to the cross in my place to pay for my sin. I admit I am not perfect, I am a sinner. And I need forgiveness. So right now, I receive your grace and your mercy. Come into my heart and make me new and be Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church, can we celebrate today?